Thank you again for joining us at this global summit. Our next session is entitled Emerging Research in Kidney Disease with Global Implications, Kidney Disease Management and Preemptive Treatments for Diabetic Kidney Disease. AKP and GW are very honored to have with us two leading medical experts from Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Daniel Wilson, who serves as Senior Medical Director at Bayer, and Dr. Ikenna Agba, who serves as the Executive Medical Director in Cardio and Renal U.S. Medical Affairs at Bayer. And what I'd like to do is have a dialogue and ask several questions of these experts that have been sent in from patients and from researchers and medical experts around the world. But the first question that I have for you each as medical experts is this. I know a lot of folks will ask questions about clinical trials and research in the pipeline, but I'm interested in asking this on behalf of patients. Can you tell me how your direct experiences with patients suffering from kidney disease informs what you do each day based on your understanding of what patients have to balance in order to pursue their aspirations and their goals while managing disease? Thank you. Well, the, there are two pivotal events that have influenced um, um, my decision uh, to pursue this space and influences my work every day. Uh, I trained and practiced medicine in Houston, Texas many, many years ago. And during that time, I took, I was what they call uh, in, an internal medicine hospitalist. So I took care of patients who were admitted to the hospital. And during that time, I was exposed to a lot of patients who they called, quote unquote, undocumented immigrants. Because of that, their immigration status, they were unable to um, uh, participate in medi Medicaid. So these patients had end-stage kidney disease and needed dialysis, but were unable to get dialysis. And so the only way they were able to get treatment was to come into the emergency room when they were volume overloaded, basically, so volume overloaded, overloaded that they had trouble breathing. And at that time, we would admit them to the hospital and do an emergency dialysis uh, for them so they can breathe easier. And they would be discharged a couple of days later and have to repeat this pattern uh, every one or two weeks. And seeing them go through this was really, really uh, disconcerting to me. And I always wished at that time that there was something I could do to delay these patients uh, uh, from getting into end-stage kidney disease. And that's one of that's been one of my biggest motivation in my work. The second event is I have a close family member who has stage four kidney disease and is very close to needing dialysis. And, and it's my passion to be able to uh, uh, develop new treatments that can slow down uh, this progression of their kidney disease. As a nephrologist, I frequently have had to, to sit down across from a patient and to tell them that they have advanced kidney disease and that it, 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 they may come to the point where they might require dialysis. That's a very difficult discussion, uh, not only for the patient, but also for the physician. Uh, I found over the years that many of my patients were really unaware that they had kidney disease. They were unaware that there were therapies that could help delay the progression of kidney disease. And I think that uh, what we really need to do is we really need to, to focus on, on kidney disease uh, at, at multiple levels. Uh, we need to inform patients. We need to work with physicians to, to recognize the, the factors that, that lead to progressive kidney disease. And we need to screen more patients to ensure that we can diagnose patients early and, and uh, focus on delaying progression of kidney disease and delaying or preventing kidney injury. So building off of these insights that you each have, can you tell me then the importance that you believe patient choice in care treatment have for patients who are trying to manage the disease and work with their doctors to come up with the best solutions that suit them while they pursue their goals? So over the past 20 years, we've seen little development in the area of, of uh, new medications to treat chronic kidney disease. Uh, but fortunately, over the last several years, 
the last five years, we've seen that we've ha now have medications uh, that have the potential to slow uh, progressive kidney damage and to reduce kidney injury. Uh, we have other medications that are coming down the line and that soon should be available uh, to further uh, contribute to uh, reducing uh, progressive kidney damage. Uh, we need, uh, we, uh, we need uh, these medications to become available to patients. Uh, uh, you know, kidney disease uh, carries uh, a tremendous bur uh, burden for an individual patient and also for a family. And uh, we need to ensure that they have access to treatments, to physicians, to healthcare systems to, to slow or prevent uh, progressive kidney damage. Well, I definitely uh, feel that having choice is very relevant for patients. Just to give you a, a comparison, uh, diabetes space, there are 74 approved medications in the U.S. Uh, today and 12 different drug classes of the drugs uh, approved for diabetes. But patients with diabetes and kidney disease, over 20 years, there were no new uh, medications approved in this space until, uh, until two years ago. And um, uh, with the uh, approval of a, a new class two years ago, and potentially, hopefully later this year, approval of our investigational agent. These will be only two new classes uh, approved in the last 20 years to treat diabetic kidney disease, which is a more severe and more uh, dangerous disease than diabetes alone. So I think it's really important for, for patients and families to have access and choices for new, new treatment options. For our patient and caregiver audience, can you tell me some of the things that are going on at Bear that give you inspiration to show up every day at work with enthusiasm? And what is it that's going on in terms of innovation and treatments that patients around the globe should know so they could gain some enthusiasm or some hope from what you are working on every day? Bayer as a company has made a huge investment in, into the cardiorenal space because we recognize is it's a disease state that with high unmet need and high burden in the United States. Not only are we investing in, in new potential medications to slow down the progression and slow down mortality in this space, there's been significant uh, investment made to raise awareness around earlier um, testing and screening to diagnose patients earlier in order to slow down progression uh, to end-stage kidney disease. So Bayer is not only investing in new treatments, but they're also investing in uh, disease state awareness so people know about this disease. We're even working on tools uh, to help patients have better conversations with their doctors, ask them uh, to check for the right tests to understand what's going on with their kidneys and so we're we're and we're also partnering with various medical societies and patient advocacy groups such as yours in order to increase awareness around this space well i'm fortunate to have joined bear at a time where our research and development is focused on kidney disease and delaying progression of kidney disease over the course of the fa last five years, Bayer has been engaged in, in a very large clinical trial uh, to determine if we could reduce cardiovascular events and as well as progression of, of kidney disease uh, in patients uh, who have chronic kidney disease and, and diabetes. This really is the largest clinical trial ever performed in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease and, and diabetes. Uh, we've we, we had the opportunity to report out the results uh, of the first part of this large clinical trial in October of, of 2020 at the American uh, Society of Nephrology meeting. That's the uh, major scientific congress for kidney doctors. Uh, that uh, the information uh, and the outcome of that study was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, you know, 
this was a culmination of, of a uh, concentrated five-year effort to 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 focus on uh, to, to delaying the progression of kidney disease and reducing cardiovascular events. The trial had a positive outcome, and you you'll soon be hearing more about this medication. And here's a question for policy leaders and elected leaders around the world who may be listening uh, to you today. What are the developments that are going on in diabetic kidney disease that will help relieve the burden on society and governments in terms of the costs, both direct and indirect, that they should know about? And along with that, can you tell me the types of things, both in the near term and short term, that you think elected leaders and appointed leaders across the globe should be aware of in terms of innovation in diabetic kidney disease? Fortunately, I think uh, our government and, and uh, to a certain extent uh, other uh, uh, governments are, are now recognizing uh, the severity and, and the impact that kidney disease has on patients as well as their healthcare systems. In, in the United States uh, in 2020, we had an executive order that began to focus us on uh, developing therapies and approaches uh, and uh, to treat patients with kidney disease. In other words, we're accelerating our efforts uh, to uh, identify kidney disease and to provide appropriate th therapies uh, for patients. We need to ensure that this effort continues. We need to ensure that this effort uh, is uh, supported by uh, our, our government and by our healthcare providers uh, in order to reduce the uh, number of patients that uh, go to develop severe kidney disease and require dialysis. We have the potential uh, to, uh, to improve healthcare we have the potential to reduce healthcare costs by, by addressing this in, in a concentrated way. Uh, our quality agencies, uh, the national uh, quality assurance groups are now recommending that, that uh, patients with diabetes at least once a year have a screening to determine whether or not they have a kidney, chronic kidney disease or whether or not they have early signs of chronic kidney disease. Kidney disease is asymptomatic, and, and you need a, a laboratory test in, in order to, to, to determine if a patient has early kidney disease. So a simple, inexpensive urine test and a simple blood test will enable physicians to screen patients appropriately, make early diagnosis, and help us prevent progression of kidney disease. Yes, uh, we're actually partnering with various health systems within the United States to provide them with tools to identify high-risk patients earlier. That way they can potentially um, intervene earlier to prevent uh, worsening of their kidney disease. And so we're also uh, trying to work with them to um, encourage um, updating their their health information technology or their electronic health records to remind them to do the screening, the guideline recommended screening for patients. That way, if patients have uh, kidney disease in, a, in addition to their diabetes, that they could be diagnosed earlier and treated earlier to prevent progression of their kidney disease. Kidney disease, unfortunately, has been uh, a disease that's been very under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated. Di and so, uh, and even though it's a, uh, it's, it, it's a serious disease, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of um, inertia in terms of diagnosing, treating the disease. So we're trying to work with health systems and physicians groups to help them um, identify these um, patients earlier. And finally, there's been a major shift over the past 10 years towards patient-centered medicine. And while for some folks that might be rhetoric, for folks that are in the private sector and especially in the pharmaceutical industry, we know that's a substantive commitment to patient-centered medicine. Can you tell us why uh, patients should be excited to be participants in clinical trials and in research and why their insights actually matter from your perspective at Bayer Pharmaceuticals? Um, from our perspective, we always try to put the patient first in everything that we do, whether it's in developing a drug or in coming up with our medical strategy. It's really important 
to incorporate the patient perspective in what you do. Because ultimately, the drugs and therapies we develop, the number one aim is to benefit patient. How would you know what is benefiting a patient without getting their perspective or getting their view? So we make a very concerted effort to work with patients, patient advocacy groups, or, or different medical societies that work with patients to to gather their insights and their perspectives in, in, in all the drugs that we're developing and when we're developing our, our medical strategies on, on how to improve access to these new medications. I've been impressed that uh, many of our professional organizations are now including patients in, 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 on committees uh, to help us better understand the impact that disease has uh, on them and has on uh, their, their, their activities of daily living. Uh, similarly, I've now seen that some of our major scientific congresses routinely include patients to give their perspective on, on the need for additional research or the outcomes uh, uh, that uh, uh, arise from different clinical trials. I think we need to continue with an incorporating patients and, and advocacy organizations to, to move us forward. Uh, patients give very interesting perspectives on uh, clinical research, on, on, uh, on, the, on their disease that sometimes are missed when we develop a clinical trial. Uh, so uh, I continue to, to support the, uh, patients and, and advocacy, or advocacy organizations in, in terms of, of uh, working with us to, to ensure that, that our, not, not only do we have positive outcomes from our clinical research trials, but that we have outcomes that are important to patients, that we recognize you know, the factors that uh, contribute to improve quality of life uh, uh, with, uh, and incorporate that in, into our clinical trials. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Agba for joining us at the Global Summit. We very much value your involvement and we appreciate the partnership with Bayer Pharmaceutical AAKP and GW in this summit and in many of the other activities that we have underway. We especially appreciate your comments on the importance of patients, their insights and their involvement and engagement with Bayer and with other companies to make certain that kidney patients are involved in the solutions and treatments that are being developed for them. This issue of diabetic kidney disease is of such fundamental importance to patients around the world and to AAKP that at this point in our global summit, we've decided to go ahead and rerun a very special presentation that was done for us by Dr. Susan Quaggan, who's the president of the American Society of Nephrology. Dr. Quaggan joined AAKP late last year on a session on diabetic kidney disease or DKD. Richard Knight and I have been very involved with Susan over the years. She's a very strong patient champion and somebody who really understands that patients must be involved in the solutions that are being developed for them because without their voice, essentially, they really don't have a choice. Dr. Quaggan serves as the uh, chair of ASN's Diabetic Kidney Disease Collaborative, and she's the director of the Feinberg Cardiovascular and Research Institute and chief of nephrology and hypertension at the Department of Medicine at Northwestern University. It's a very special pleasure for us to repeat this presentation by Dr. Quaggan. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank both Paul Conway and Richard Knight for the wonderful invitation to be with you today. Mr. Knight and Mr. Conway asked me to present today on a new initiative that is happening at the American Society of Nephrology that I am very excited about. It focuses on diabetic kidney disease and we are known as the DKD-C. To set the scope of the issue, um, we are in the midst of a pandemic right now in very difficult times. But preceding this pandemic, I think everybody in the audience knows that there's been a long-standing epidemic of diabetes throughout the world, and, and there will be one for many, many years and decades to come. Now, this is an old slide uh, that I've chosen uh, to show, 
And in 2015, there was an estimated 415 million people in the world living with diabetes. And said another way, that is one in 11 adults. If we focus on the United States alone, there is an estimated 48 million individuals living with diabetes. Now, the majority of people with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. However, irregardless of whether you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, 30 to 40 percent will develop diabetic kidney disease. And this is a staggering number. And in fact, many people in the, in the public really don't recognize the impact of kidney disease in diabetes. So, you know, what can we do to prevent kidney disease and diabetes? And this slide talks about sort of standard of care. This standard of care existed when I was a nephrology trainee, and that is now 30 years ago. And so for a number of decades, the recommendations really did not change very much. There is no cure for diabetes and there is no cure for kidney disease and diabetes. However, there are ways to slow the progression of kidney disease and to slow the progression to kidney failure. And I think most people know that these things include excellent blood sugar control, and this is a combination of diet, exercise, and medications excellent blood pressure control. And in particular, there is a class of blood pressure medications that have a long name. They're known as renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors, and this includes the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers. And I can tell you, I remember 30 years ago, sitting in a room, a classroom, hearing the results of this landmark trial that showed for the first time a new type of drug that could really dramatically slow the progression of kidney disease in patients with diabetes. Incredibly exciting, and I can still visualize it. Um, it had such an impact on me. Despite us knowing for over 30 years now that this therapy is really beneficial. A recent study showed that patients with diabetes who should be receiving these medications as standard of care, in fact, only 30% of patients were receiving them. So this is very, very, um, this is a, a real issue and uh, we need to understand why these therapies haven't been adopted, why they're not prescribed and why they're not getting to the patients who need them. In addition uh, to these therapies, certainly looking after heart risk factors, looking after lipids and other things are also important in diabetes. So this is one real issue, getting the medications that are needed to patients. The second issue, which is actually very exciting and uh, is energizing, is that there are a number of new therapies that have now entered the market. And, you know, it really is time to change history of diabetic kidney disease. Over the past few years, there have been a number of new therapies that target the kidney specifically. In particular, a class of medications known as SGLT2 inhibitors or sodium glucose transport inhibitors that were originally designed and discovered through research. And the thought was it could help blood glucose or blood sugar control by promoting sugar loss in the urine. However, the clinical trials done in thousands of patients showed that it's not really good at lowering blood sugar. However, they are tremendously powerful at protecting the kidney in patients with diabetes. So a kidney, a truly kidney targeted therapy. In addition, these drugs also have profound and powerful effects on protecting the heart in patients with diabetes. In addition to this really exciting new class of drugs, there are a number of other new players on the, on the scene, and these include GLP-1 agonists, GLP-1 receptor agonists, a new study that was stopped early because of positive effects, looking at finerenone, which is an aldosterone uh, mineralocorticoid receptor inhibitor. And all of these are showing powerful protection of the kidney and also of the heart in diabetes. And interestingly, um, it appears that the SGLT2 inhibitors have additional effects even in patients who don't have diabetes but also have kidney disease. Based on all of this information, the scope of the problem, we know there's an epidemic of diabetes, staggering numbers of individuals who have diabetic kidney disease. We know that 
for the past 30 years, patients with diabetes have not been getting the best care. So now with these new therapies, um, there was a real uh, passion, a real desire to ensure that we get these new therapies to patients who need them. So the American Society of Nephrology launched a task force known as the Diabetic Kidney Disease Collaborative. And I show uh, an image here of all the members of this task force, which I have the privilege to chair. On the left-hand side, I think known to many of you uh, here, um, Dr. Patrick G, who is an ambassador uh, and on the board of directors at AAKP and is our patient voice and advocate on the task force. David Cherney standing next to him, who is a nephrologist at the University of Toronto. Uh, world-renowned diabetes and diabetic kidney disease researcher and physician. Next to him is Dr. Catherine Tuttle, who is both a nephrologist and a diabetes doctor and endocrinologist, and she works in Washington State, and another expert researcher and physician in diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, Alan Kleiger, uh, who has been on the task force of numerous uh, uh, committees at the American Society of Nephrology, including the COVID task force, um, bringing his expertise. I'm standing uh, next to Alan. Next to me is Ray Harris, who is the past president of the American Society of Nephrology and the Kidney Health Initiative co-chair, uh, nephrologist at Vanderbilt. And then finally, Chip Brocious, who's the chief of nephrology uh, at Arizona, also a researcher and nephrologist interested in diabetic kidney disease. So when we launched this uh, collaborative, we had uh, a charge, and the charge is to develop strategies to promote the rapid and universal adoption of these powerful new therapies, such as the SGLT2 inhibitors that I talked about a couple of slides ago, to make sure they are provided to all patients who need them. So our objectives to you know, accomplish this charge is to empower and uh, engage nephrologists and the kidney care team so that they prescribe these new therapies for patients with diabetic kidney disease. We want them to take, take charge. In addition, we want to promote partnerships that are absolutely critical between nephrologists and other healthcare providers that look after patients with diabetes. This includes primary care physicians, endocrinologists or diabetes doctors, and heart specialists or cardiologists to truly encourage a team-based approach to patient care, which we feel is so important. To develop educational resources for patients, for healthcare providers, to ensure there is a rapid adoption of these new powerful therapies. And also to work with policy and regulatory agencies, as well as payers, to make sure that it's possible for patients to receive these medications and for all patients to receive them. So how are we doing this? So the task force you saw, uh, you aren't seeing an incredible group of staff, people at ASN who helped bring this all together. Um, over the past uh, couple of years, this task force has met weekly on virtual meetings and more recently every other week. Uh, we hosted an in-person strategy conference in Washington, D.C. in January of this past year. And stakeholders who were present were patients, uh, the National Kidney Foundation, our partners at AAKP, nephrologists from around the country. There were representatives from payers, from health systems, from the FDA, from human health services, from pharmaceutical companies, and our research partners at the National Institutes of Health. And out of this very energizing meeting, um, we've developed a white paper with a long list of de deliverables and a description of subgroups to help us accomplish the charge. And this includes an educational materials and advocacy subgroup, a patient-oriented project sub subgroup, a pilot project subgroup, meetings and collaborative subgroup. We are in the midst of three webinars. The first was hosted in August, and this was spearheaded by Patrick G, uh, with a number of patients uh, and nephrologists and endocrinologists talking about diabetes, diabetes and kidney disease and management in the time of COVID-19. And if you didn't get an opportunity to log into that webinar, it's available on our ASN website and freely downloadable, and it was phenomenal. Our second webinar is scheduled for September, and this one is going to focus on nephrologists and the kidney care team. 
to really uh, in, empower and engage uh, the kidney care team to adopt these therapies, start prescribing them, and to talk to patients about them. And in December, we're going to have our multidisciplinary webinar inviting our cardiology uh, heart colleagues, endocrinologists, um, to discuss the newest standards of care uh, to ensure that we slow uh, the progression of kidney disease and diabetes and also slow the progression of heart disease in our patients. What I've talked about today, and I can't tell you how excited I am about all of these new therapies. They are going to transform the history and the course and the trajectory of kidney disease and diabetes. However, despite their ability to really dramatically slow the progression of kidney disease and prevent patients from uh, ending up on dialysis for years and over a decade. We can't stop. We're only going to stop when we cure diabetes and when we cure kidney disease. So we need to continue to work together, partners with AAKP and ASN to advocate for more kidney focused fun funding with our NIH and NIDDK partners. And uh, I can't tell you, and I think everybody here knows that Congress listens to patients. And I would also encourage you as patients and providers to um, consider enrolling in clinical trials and to be sure to check out the clinicaltrials.gov website. And it's only when we get great representation in these clinical trials will we really be able to make an impact in this disease. So my final slide, I just want to um, finish um, and say that partnering with patients is absolutely essential for success of this initiative, of this collaborative initiative. Patients absolutely have the most powerful voice. And if you have any interest in getting engaged with the DKDC task force or learning more about it, please reach out to us and continue to work with AAKP or you can email the Executive Vice President Todd Ibrahim at ASN. I absolutely know that together we will win this good fight and together we are all going to sock it to kidney disease. Again, I want to thank Paul and uh, Richard Knight for the incredible invitation to participate in this very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Quaggan, and we appreciate you allowing us to rerun your special session that you did for the American Association of Kidney Patients on diabetic kidney disease. At this time, we'd like to introduce you also to Dr. Catherine Tuttle. She serves as the Executive Director for Research at Providence Healthcare. She's a professor of medicine at the University of Washington, and she's the co-principal investigator for the Institute for Translational Health Sciences. Dr. Tuttle also gave a special presentation on diabetic kidney diseases to the American Association of Kidney Patients. Because this issue, diabetic kidney disease, is such a profound issue in the kidney community, and for patients that are being diagnosed at an increasingly earlier age and in minority communities, we think it's especially important to provide as much programming as possible in this area. This is now our presentation of Dr. Tuttle on this same issue, diabetic kidney disease. Hello, I'd like to thank the American Association of Kidney Patients and George Washington University for the opportunity to present here at the second annual Global Kidney Summit. I'm Dr. Katherine Tuttle, and I'm pleased to talk about treatment for CKD and diabetes, and I'll be basing my presentation on the newly released KDGO guidelines that have recently been updated based upon emerging clinical evidence in this field. Here are my disclosures. My objectives today will be to review therapeutic approaches for treatment of chronic kidney disease and diabetes, to recognize use of newer glucose lowering agents to reduce chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular risks, and to discuss the importance of comprehensive care for patients with diabetes and CKD. I'd first like to start off with the definition because oftentimes people are confused about what is diabetic kidney disease versus diabetic nephropathy. Well, they're really not interchangeable terms. So diabetic kidney disease, also known as DKD, is a clinical diagnosis based upon albuminuria, low estimated GFR or both in diabetes. So DKD is really chronic kidney disease and diabetes, but not a specific pathologic phenotype. Whereas diabetic nephropathy is used to specify classic glomerular lesions in diabetes, such as glomerular basement membrane thickening, mesangial expansion and nodules, 
ponocytes loss, and endothelial disruption. So for the purpose of this discussion, we will be talking about DKD or CKD and diabetes because the clinical trials that have informed this update have been based on a clinical diagnosis, not on a specific pathologic phenotype. So first off, I'd like to start with a consideration of what are the risks of diabetic kidney disease. In nephrology, our conventional focus has been on progression to end-stage kidney disease, clearly a very important endpoint. However, only 10% of patients who develop diabetic kidney disease will progress to end-stage kidney disease. Instead, most will actually die of other causes without reaching end-stage kidney disease. About half of cardiovascular diseases, but importantly, a third of infections, particularly of pneumonia and sepsis, which are particularly relevant now in the era of COVID-19. And we will be awaiting uh, the results of what happens to this high-risk group uh, in the COVID era, which will probably become an even bigger issue as we go forward. I'd like to start out with the fact that despite the serious risk of diabetic kidney disease, there are very low rates of, of kidney disease awareness and detection in the current era. And this is true whether or not a person has diabetes. So as you'll see on the left panel, this shows awareness over the past 20 years. And even in patients at the highest risk of end-stage kidney disease, awareness is still only about 40% among patients and providers alike. As a result, we're doing very poorly with detection. In two large US healthcare systems with a cohort of about 2.6 million patients between 20, 2006 and 2017, albuminuria or proteinuria was measured in only 15% of patients with diabetes and CKD, and in just 5% of patients with diabetes who were at risk and did not yet have CKD. So in order to improve outcomes, we have to clearly do a much better job of being aware and detecting the condition to begin with. The KDGO guidelines start out with the fundamentals of providing comprehensive care to patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And as you can see at the bottom of the pyramid, it really rests on healthy lifestyle as well as control of condition, conventional risk factors for chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. That includes glycemic control, blood pressure control, and lipid management. And now we're recommending for most patients that they also receive an SGLT2 inhibitor along with the renin angiotensin system inhibitor for kidney protection. And in some patients, antiplatelet therapies to reduce the cardiovascular risk. And again, I will remind you that cardiovascular diseases are more common than kidney disease events. So we really need to be addressing both of these important conditions if we wanna improve outcomes that matter to patients. With regard to lifestyle, Clearly, healthy lifestyle is fundamental to treatment of both diabetes and CKD. And we have recommended that a protein intake be limited to 0.8 gram per kilo per day for those with diabetes and non-dialysis CKD. Higher levels of protein have been associated with CKD progression. And this level of protein intake will maintain good nutrition while at the same time not increasing the risk of kidney disease progression. We'd also like to emphasize the importance of plant proteins because for any given amount of protein, plant proteins are more kidney protective than animal proteins. Once patients start hemodialysis, there are protein losses and catabolic conditions that uh, occur with dialysis and they then need a higher protein intake, which is why we then switch to recommending more than a gram and up to 1.2 gram per kilo per day. The other important lifestyle intervention that is critical for patients with diabetes and CKD is limiting sodium intake to less than two grams per day. This has been around for a long time, but considering the importance of blood pressure control on mitigating CKD progression in diabetes, we are emphasizing the importance of limiting sodium intake and have provided some practical tips about how to do this. We'd also like to emphasize that the current standard of care really is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And this standard of care has been in place for some 20 years since the original National Kidney Foundation KDOKI guidelines came out for diabetes and CKD. And the importance of initiating these therapies because nearly 20 years in, we're still falling short on treating most of the patients who would benefit. We also have some recommended strategies for mitigating risks such as hyperkalemia or an increase in creatinine with the goal of trying to keep patients on these therapies whenever possible. 
and that the, we would reduce or stop these agents only as a last resort if we haven't been able to manage these complications. These were the original uh, trials in type 2 diabetes and CKD that evaluated the angiotensin receptor blockers. You can see these public studies were published in 2001, so nearly 20 years out. Uh, and these were the last treatments uh, prior to SGLT2 inhibitors that had been approved for the treatment of CKD and diabetes. One tested uh, <clears throat> Losartan in the renal trial and Herbisartan in the IDNT trial. And while risk was reduced, you can see the risk reductions were modest, 16 and 20% respectively, le leaving a very large absolute residual risk. Now, how well are we doing with the standard of care? Not nearly well enough. This is another report from Cure CKD on medication use in patients with CKD in two large US healthcare systems, the UCLA and the Providence healthcare systems across five Western states. And as you can see, while ACE inhibitor and ARB uh, use increased over time, even in the most recent era, only about 14% of patients with uh, CKD overall were receiving an ACE or an ARB. And in those with diabetes, CKD, and hypertension, perhaps the hardest indication to use these agents, ACE inhibitor or ARB use was just 25%. So one of the reasons that our patients are not uh, benefiting as much as they could is that uh, we are underutilizing the only agents that we had approved uh, for diabetic kidney disease in the past 20 years. And even among those who have received them, the risk reduction is relatively modest and not more than 20%. So clearly there has been an enormous unmet need for better treatments. There have been many new therapies under study for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, time does not permit us to have a detailed discussion but I just wanted to give you a, an example of the kind of approaches that have been taken. But where we've really seen deliverance is actually with the newer antihyperglycemic agents. And at the time these studies first came out, they were rather a surprise, but they really delivered in remarkable ways that we haven't seen in some two decades. This is just showing the clinical trials of diabetes drugs over just over the past seven years. This is 2013 to 2020. So as you can see, we've studied an enormous number of these agents. Now, um, most recently, the drugs of particular interest have been the SGLT2 inhibitors shown in the pink box and the GLP-1 receptor agonists shown in the orange boxes. These trials have mostly focused on cardiovascular safety and then cardiovascular efficacy, but importantly, they generated data from secondary outcomes on kidney disease that showed remarkable benefits that, again, at the time these studies first came out were quite surprising. And then the Credence trial reported last year was the first trial with an SGLT2 inhibitor conducted in patients with diabetic kidney disease, which was the first time in the history of nephrology we've had a trial stopped early because of overwhelming benefit, and that's what I'll be talking about next. So first off, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the USA Today headliner version and then show you selected data to back up the claims. So first off, in the cardiovascular outcome trials of these agents in type 2 diabetes, not only did we learn that they were safe from a cardiovascular perspective, but they also delivered in terms of superiority, meaning they reduced risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. And these include the three-point MACE, that is the so-called atherosclerotic events of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death. But most importantly, they have significantly reduced the risk of heart failure events. And for two of the three agents tested so far, have also been shown to reduce cardiovascular deaths. With regard to kidney disease, across the board, they decreased macroalbuminuria, decline in GFR, and end-stage kidney disease. And even in patients with pre-existing kidney disease, these cardiovascular benefits and kidney disease benefits are present. So they really hit the sweet spot in patients with CKD who are at risk of both of these important outcomes and, and deliver what we want, reduced rates of death and among the living, maintaining better health. This is uh, the main result from the Credence trial. This trial was conducted in people with diabetes and CKD with EGFR between 30 and 90 and macroalbuminuria with U. UACR or albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 300 uh, and less than 5,000 milligram per gram. 
And these patients all received the standard of care. So in contrast to usual practice, 99.9% .9 of patients in credence were receiving an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And on top of that standard of care, there's another 30% reduction in the major outcome, which was end-stage kidney disease, serum creatinine doubling, a marker of kidney disease progression, and death attributed to either CKD or CBD. As I pointed out, this was the first trial stopped for overwhelming efficacy. And I'd also like to point out that the FDA uh, approved canagliflozin, the agent used in the Cretans trial, for the treatment of diabetic kidney disease and included not only the indication to reduce kidney disease endpoints, but also to reduce CBD death. And this is the first time we've ever had a drug approved to prevent death in patients with kidney disease. So this was really a landmark study for multiple reasons. This is just showing the primary outcome by various subgroups at different levels of GFR, higher and lower albuminuria, and the, the benefits are clear across the strata of eGFR and albuminuria. In a subsequent meta-analysis that included the cardiovascular outcome trials where the CKD endpoints were secondary and the credence trial in which they were primary, you see across the board, however we wanted to combine the events, there was a benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitor class shown by the large diamond to the left of the line of unity showing reduced risk. There had been a theoretical concern that SGLT2 inhibitors could reduce, uh, could increase risk of AKI, and whether in the credence trial shown on the right, uh, the bottom uh, bullet in the, in the forest plot, or in the meta-analysis with the credence data combined with the cardiovascular outcome data, we actually see reduced risk of acute kidney injury in the range of 25%. So not only are the agents safe from an AKI perspective, they actually are beneficial in terms of reducing risk of acute kidney injury. How might this be working? The first cardiovascular outcome trial to report kidney outcomes was the infrared trial shown on the left. As you can see, the baseline GFR was 76 because these patients were selected for heart disease, not kidney disease risk. And uh, from this baseline of relatively normal GFR in the placebo group shown in gray, you see progressive decline over time. Whereas in the impetrated patients, whether at the higher or lower dose, we see an abrupt initial decline in GFR of about 5 mL per minute, but then this stabilizes over time so that by the end of the observation period, GFR was higher in the impetrated patients than in the placebo patients. When we look to Credence, a group that was selected for kidney disease, you can see they start with a lower baseline GFR as expected, 56, but you still see the pattern of the abrupt early decline, about 5 mL per minute of eGFR with stabilization over time. This really harkens to a hemodynamic mechanism, really the only explanation for an abrupt decline so quickly within a week or two of starting the agents, but preservation in kidney function over time. This is just a reminder of some renal physiology about why this might be so. And um, I'd first like to start out with uh, a review of what happens to renal hemodynamics in uh, diabetes. Early in diabetes, we see an uh, actual increased GFR or glomerular hyperfiltration, but even when GFR declines, remnant nephrons or remaining function units in the kidney are still hyperfiltering at the single nephron unit level. This is because blood flowing into the uh, capillary, the glomerulus, is uh, increased because of dilation of the inflowing or afferent arteriole and because the downstream or outflowing arteriole is relatively constricted. So when I teach our medical students, I use a, a, a faucet and hose analogy and that the upstream end is like having the faucet turned on and the downstream end is like kinking the hose so that in between there's very high pressure. And we know, we have known for 40 years, this is a major mechanism of progressive kidney injury and diabetes. When we give an ACE or an ARB, they decompress the glomerulus by dilating the downstream artery, unkeeking the hose, but we still have the inflowing artery at, at pumping blood into the glomerulus at a higher than normal level. In diabetes, there's also increased glucosuria, which is 
taken up in the proximal convoluted tubule by receptors called SGLT2 transporters. These transporters also take up sodium with glucose, so that in diabetes, because of the increased uptake of glucose in the proximal tubule, there's increased uptake of sodium such that downstream in the tubule, there's less delivery of sodium chloride to the segment called the distal convoluted tubule shown in the figure uh, by the little box area. And in the specialized area called the macula densa, less sodium is taken up because less is delivered. And this has a very important effect on the inflowing artery. If you look at the blown up box, the uptake of sodium in this segment requires active transport by a sodium potassium ATPase. When ATP is used, it generates adenosine, but adenosine is not a waste product in this situation. In a paracrine fashion, meaning right next door, it moves from the macula densa to a receptor on the inflowing artery where it basically turns down the faucet. It's a relative vasoconstrictor. So when we give an SGLT2 inhibitor shown on the right, we block glucose and sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. More of these solutes transit downstream to the distal tubule, the macula densa where the box is. We restore sodium uptake. We start using ATP, generating adenosine, and we clamp down the inflowing artery. So we take care of the other limb of this. This is why we think the combination of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB with an SGLT2 inhibitor has shown such remarkable effectiveness for reducing CKD progression in diabetes. There are likely many other mechanisms. These, uh, this is not by any means uh, suggesting that this is the only mechanism, but it is a major mechanism and one that we can understand in terms of how these agents work in terms of driving CKD progression. Time will not permit a detailed discussion of other mechanisms, but this one is clinically relevant and has implications for how we actually apply the therapies. This is just showing the main cardiovascular outcomes in the credence population. On the top, we have CVD, death, and heart failure in a primary and secondary prevention cohort. In the bottom, the MACE, the atherosclerotic events. And in both primary and secondary prevention cohorts, we see benefit. This was the first time that a primary prevention cohort, that is a group of patients who did not yet have a cardiovascular event, were shown to have kidney protection. The cardiovascular outcome trials, only uh, benefit had been shown for primary prevention. So the other thing that Credence delivered was information to the cardiovascular community that these agents could prevent the primary onset of heart disease. And for the kidney disease community, that even in patients, with established diabetic kidney disease, we can reduce cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality in a group at very high risk. Again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about the interplay between the heart and the kidney, why this drug acting on the kidney would have such profound benefits on the heart. But clearly, the natriuretic effect and the diuretic effect are important for heart failure prevention. However, the benefits are beyond what we've seen with other diuretics. So there are many other hypotheses being tested. There's a mild ketosis, which from the standpoint of cardiovascular fuel energetics is favorable. That is beta hydroxybutyrate is a preferred myocardial fuel. There's also reduct increase in oxygen delivery because the kidney begins to make more erythropoietin. So these are things that may improve cardiac function above and beyond what we can account for by naturesis. And again, we don't have time to go into the details of this. These are active areas of investigation, and I'm sure that you'll be hearing more about these uh, potential mechanisms as time goes on. And the mechanisms are important because they will drive the clinical application and optimal use of these agents. Let's now turn to the GLP-1 receptor agonists because they're close on the heels of the SGLT2, and these drugs are also delivering in big ways for our patients. They were similarly studied in the cardiovascular outcome trials for type 2 diabetes, first for safety, but again, they met the safety bar, and now they've been shown to also show superiority with reducing risk of major adverse CBD events. However, their benefits are really confined to atherosclerotic events. There's no harm to heart failure, but no benefit. However, they are very potent in terms of reducing risk of atherosclerotic events, and two agents in the class Loraglutide and semaglutide also have indications to prevent cardiovascular death. 
With regard to the secondary kidney outcomes in the CD outcome trials across the board, they decreased macroalbuminuria and they've been shown to reduce GFR decline from early to late stage CKD. Unlike the SGLT2 inhibitors, these drugs can be used in patients with very low GFR. SGLT2 inhibitors to date have only had studies report out for patients with GFR as low as 30, whereas in the uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist trials, for example, in the dual glutide studies, we've gone down to a GFR as low as 15. And these benefits for cardiovascular and kidney disease have been demonstrated in patients with pre-existing CKD, including those with very low GFR down to 15. This is a cardiovascular outcomes trial meta-analysis showing from these studies the effect on kidney disease outcomes. Again, the diamonds to the left of the bar demonstrate benefit, reduced risk. And you can see overall it's about 17%, but remember these are cardiovascular complication, uh, cardiovascular uh, studies, so they were selected for cardiovascular risk, so less opportunity to reduce kidney disease risk, but everything goes the right direction. When albuminuria is taken out of the endpoints, so the bottom panel just showing worsening of kidney function, a uh, similar magnitude of risk reduction, but just missed statistical significance because in a population of people who don't yet have kidney disease, albuminuria is the more common outcome, therefore easier to impact uh, with a treatment intervention. However, award seven, was a clinical trial of dulaglutide compared against insulin glargine for glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes who had moderate to severe CKD. So these patients had stage 3 or 4 CKD. If you look at the panel on the left, you see the baseline GFR was 35, much lower than any of the other trials I've shown you, even for the SGLT2 inhibitor class. In the insulin-treated group, you see progressive GFR decline over the one year of the study, whereas the two doses of doula, either higher or lower dose, uh, produce GFR stabilization. And in the right panel, we just show a bar graph of change in GFR at 26 and 52 weeks. And you can see substantial GFR decline in the insulin-treated group, whereas actually there was no significant decline in eGFR in either of the doula groups. And the between-group comparisons are also highly statistically significant. This is a post, excuse me, this is a pre-specified exploratory analysis where we also looked at so-called hard outcomes of either 40% GFR decline or in-stage kidney disease. And you can see that these events overall were reduced by more than half of the highest dose dulaglutide group. And if you look in the, at the subset with macroalbuminuria, the highest risk group, you see that actually the hazard ratio was 0.25, so 75% risk reduction. And this observation held in even the group with the GFR below 30, between 15 and 30. Uh, this paper is winding its way through publication, but these data I can show you because they were presented at both ASN and ADA and uh, are in the public domain. So uh, this gives very strong rationale uh, for testing these agents in a phase three trial. And that in fact has begun, it is the FLOW trial testing semaglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist versus placebo in patients with uh, diabetes and chronic kidney disease down to a GFR of 25. How might this work? Again, we don't have time to go into the details, but yes, there is biological rationale. They work very differently than SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, these agents probably act primarily through an anti-inflammatory mechanism and an antioxidant mechanism. And interestingly enough, this may uh, be mediated not only by resident kidney cells, but also by invading cells such as macrophages and T lymphocytes that are actually recruited into the kidney in a pro-inflammatory mechanism for DKD progression. So to summarize the benefits and harms of SGLT2s and GLP1s, and we actually in the guidelines also show the DPP4 inhibitors for comparison, uh, are shown here. Uh, so where we have the most evidence is actually for SGLT2 inhibitors in terms of uh, particularly heart failure, but also some benefit on atherosclerotic events and clear kidney benefits uh, on reducing risk of end-stage kidney disease and GFR decline. Uh, we do have issues with regard to some side effects, particularly genital, genital mycotic yeast infections and diabetic ketoacidosis possibly amputations with canagliflozin, but we've recommended risk mitigation strategies, 
so that these patients can be safely treated uh, and avoid these uh, side effects. With the GLP-1 receptor agonists, I would say that uh, they are second in line, uh, but mainly because of not enough evidence, not negative evidence. Again, important effect on atherosclerotic, re reducing atherosclerotic effects. No harm for heart failure, but no particular benefit. They are anti-albuminuric. They do slow GFR decline. And we're testing, and hopefully we'll learn soon about their effect on, on hard kidney disease endpoints. The main side effects here are primarily gastrointestinal, nausea and vomiting. And most patients will develop a tolerance to this over time. So starting with a lower dose, coaching them through the initial month or so of treatment usually uh, is successful. The DPP-4 inhibitors just have not delivered in terms of any of the either cardiovascular or kidney outcomes. They do lower albuminuria, but this has not translated to effects on GFR or other kidney endpoints. So at this point, they can be an adjunct to glycemic control and can be used with low GFR, but are not believed to have uh, true kidney protective effects like the other two classes. So with regard to the hierarchy of therapy, we're dialing in now again to that pyramid we started with, the base of healthy lifestyle, activity, nutrition, weight management, with regard to glycemic control, if the GFR uh, will tolerate it, metformin still is a first-line therapy, uh, along with an SGLT2 inhibitor. And then uh, for patients who have not achieved glycemic goals, or perhaps who have not had optimal albuminuria reduction, or who cannot tolerate metformin, we then recommend a GLP-1 receptor agonist be considered. And then really everything else uh, down below. So I'll wrap up by saying, our long-term standard of care for treatment of CKD and diabetes is an ACE or an ARB, but these agents remain strikingly underutilized in clinical practice, which is an area that needs to be addressed along with new therapies. The new therapy on the block is an SGLT2 inhibitor for CKD and type 2 diabetes with GFR greater than 30, and the indication is not just glycemic control, but more importantly, to prevent GFR decline, end-stage kidney disease, heart failure, atherosclerotic CVD, and CVD death, the big stuff. And in fact, these drugs don't do very much for glycemic control in patients with low GFR, but they're still beneficial for patient protection that is preventing the major events of diabetic kidney disease. GLP-1 receptor agonists are very effective antihyperglycemic agents, even with low GFR in contrast to the SGLT2 inhibitor class. And they also have organ protective effects, uh, primarily preventing atherosclerotic CVD and emerging evidence that they lower at risk of albuminuria and GFR decline, and we'll soon learn if there are true effects on hard endpoints. And finally, we want to emphasize the importance of patient self-management, providing education and team-based care in order to give the full 360 of comprehensive care uh, for the best outcomes for our patients with diabetes and CKD. And with that, I thank you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today speaking to the issue of diabetic kidney diseases. We're especially pleased with the presence of Bayer Pharmaceuticals at the Global Summit and the efforts of all researchers around the world who are working on this issue. It's timely, it's important, and again, it's impacting people at a younger age and disproportionately in minority communities. Together we can and we will work to solve this issue. Thank you.